thank you UPDF for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for a powerful AI powered PDF editor and productivity tool, check out the first link in the description. By the mid 1990s, Silicon Graphics was the crown jewel of high performance computing with a market cap of nearly $7 billion and clients ranging from film studios to weapons labs. SGI was a giant in the computer market. They built the machines that made Jurassic Park's dinosaurs run, sent NASA spacecraft designs to the stars and gave the Pentagon the simulation power to model nuclear tests without explosions. For a moment, it seemed like SGI was unshakable, having a near monopoly in a market it invented, the market of high-end graphics. But within a decade of its $7 billion peak, it would all come crashing down, first being blindsided by the relentless rise of the Intel processors and Microsoft Windows NT, then being outflanked by companies like Nvidia, which made graphics cards that SGI initially dismissed as toys, a misjudgment that would lead to its death. This is the rise and fall of SGI, the company that made Jurassic Park possible but couldn't escape extinction itself. Before we get into the epic rise and fall of SGI, let's take a moment to talk about a game-changing software. UPDF is an AI-powered software that makes reading, editing, and managing PDFs faster and smarter than ever, and they have kindly sponsored this video. UPDF is able to take any document you upload within the software and within seconds understand the entire PDF with full context. Using UPDF's built-in AI, you can then chat with it to ask it questions about the document and it will respond with detailed answers, within seconds using the PDF as the basis for its answers. You can also use UPDF to edit the PDF itself, like changing already written text or changing the background, among many other features. You can also summarize a specific part of the PDF by simply highlighting the text content of that portion of the PDF and copying it and pasting it into a special summary tab within the software and it will give you an intelligent and detailed summary. Check out UPDF today with the first link in the description and see how AI can supercharge your workflow. Now let's dive back into the story of the company that made Jurassic Park's dinosaurs come to life and then went extinct. After a turbulent childhood in Plainview, Texas and a stint in the US Navy, Jim Clark began cultivating an interest in electronics during the 1960s. This passion eventually carried him into academia, culminating in a PhD from the University of Utah in 1974. At the time, the University of Utah was one of the pioneering centers of computer graphics research in the world. At Utah, Clark was exposed to emerging ideas in interactive computing and graphics hardware. Following his PhD, Clark soon transitioned into academia academic roles, first teaching at the University of California Santa Cruz before joining Stanford University's faculty in the late 1970s. At Stanford, he became increasingly immersed in cutting-edge work at the intersection of hardware design and computer graphics. His connections at Stanford linked him with researchers at the legendary Xerox PARC, one of the most influential hubs of computing innovation during the 1970s. With support from ARPA, Clark collaborated with PARC researchers on a project to explore three-dimensional graphic systems research that paved the way for the invention of the geometry engine. The geometry engine was a breakthrough in computational graphics. It was a specialized microprocessor capable of performing matrix transformations and point mapping at speeds unattainable by general purpose CPUs of the era. In essence, Clark and his Stanford team, along with Xerox Park engineers, had created what was essentially a precursor to the modern graphics processing unit. The geometry engine demonstrated how real-time three-dimensional graphics could be made practical for engineering design and visualization, areas that traditional computers simply could not handle efficiently. Clark realized that the geometry engine could be the heart of a commercial system that fulfilled the growing need for tools that could model complex surfaces, run simulations, and visualize data in ways engineers, architects, and scientists could directly apply within their respective industries. With this insight, in 1982, with $25,000 in funding that he and a friend had put together, he co-founded Silicon Graphics Inc. Along 
along with seven of the Stanford students. STI's first computers were the Iris 1000, 2000 and 3000 series. These were Unix workstations but with immense graphical capabilities. They had multiple geometry engines under the hood doing the heavy 3D lifting. The advanced graphical processing of the Iris computers made them extremely expensive. The Iris 2000 launched in 1984 cost around $40,000 and the high-end Iris 3000 series could easily push past $100,000 depending on your configuration. But high prices for the markets that STI targeted were not such a big concern. Among their first big customers was Defense Labs, Research Labs and of course NASA. These were organizations that couldn't afford to wait hours for batch rendering. They needed interactive visualization now and they were willing to pay top dollar for it. In 1984, Jim Clark, STI's relatively inexperienced founder and CEO, stepped aside as CEO and was replaced by Ed McCracken, a Hewlett Packard executive who was tasked with scaling the company while Clark would focus on technology and strategy. At this point, STI had already secured lucrative contracts in aerospace, defense and oil explorations, fields where visualization wasn't a luxury but a necessity. This combination of dominant technology and big sticky contracts gave STI a moat no computer company could easily cross, which made it a very attractive investment. In January 1986, STI went public, raising about $17.2 million. But STI had a problem, distribution. They were a small company without a massive sales force, so they struck a deal with Control Data Corporation in 1986. CDC was a major supercomputer vendor and agreed to resell STI's machines under its own branding. This partnership got STI's technology into big accounts it couldn't have reached alone. By the late 1980s, STI's revenue hit about $167 million, but STI still mostly dominated the high-end graphics market. Smaller animation houses, universities, and game developers were priced out, but this was about to change. STI had its sights set on the entry-level market. By the late 80s, STI completely dominated the high-end graphics market but hadn't yet cracked into the lower tier of affordable workstations. Their machines were incredibly powerful but they cost as much as a house. That changed in 1988 with the introduction of the personal iris lineup. For the first time, STI brought graphics hardware into a smaller more affordable desk side package. The personal iris 4D20 launched at around $20,000 and higher-end models like the 4D35 climbed into the $40,000 to $50,000 range. Still expensive by personal computer standards but suddenly within reach for smaller animation houses, universities and independent developers. Before the personal Iris line of computers, STI's earlier Iris machines had been built on Motorola 68K CPUs. But by the mid 1980s, these processors were hitting performance limits so STI made a bold move. They dumped Motorola and adopted MIPS's RISC CPUs for their next generation systems which included the personal Iris line of computers. Then in 1991, STI took it a step further, releasing an even more affordable line of computers that would go on to be one of the most popular product lines, which was the Indigo series. The STI Indigo was sleek, compact and sported the iconic purple case. The Indigo was priced starting at around $8,000 to $12,000 with higher end models exceeding $30,000. It featured Mix's R3000 and R4000 CPUs, optional acceleration graphics boards and built-in audio and video input output that made it a dream machine for multimedia creators. The Indigo quickly became the workstation of choice for film studios, industrial design firms and video game developers. The secret source behind the success of the machine was STI's graphics libraries. Developers could write once for STI's hardware and scale across the whole product line. STI's entry into the lower end workstation market fueled its already insane growth. STI's revenue went from $5.4 million in 1984 to over $230 million by 1989 and by 1993 they had crossed 1 billion dollars but just as STI was finding its footing in the entry-level workstation market the workstation market was coming under threat Microsoft's Windows NT and Intel x86 processors were emerging as credible alternatives for professional workstations companies that previously had no choice but to buy STI machines began seeing Intel based PCs coupled with Windows NT capable of running 3d applications as viable alternatives especially as software 
developers optimized for Windows NT, Microsoft had licensed portions of SGI's graphics pipeline and API concepts to build NT's workstation class 3D capabilities. SGI had begun to recognize market threats quite early on. In 1992, it acquired MIPS Computer Systems. MIPS was SGI's main processor provider, and the acquisition gave SGI full control of MIPS. By controlling MIPS, SGI could keep its ecosystem proprietary and maintain a performance edge. Rather than having to compete on mass-produced commonly available hardware, they could compete on proprietary hardware that no one else had. For the moment, despite the threat of Intel and Microsoft, SGI still maintained a strong market position. SGI's workstations powered the groundbreaking effects of Jurassic Park in 1993, where Industrial Light and Magic used Indigo and Indigo systems for modeling and animation, alongside SGI's Onyx supercomputers for rendering. The Onyx had been released in the same year of 1993 as a full-blown graphic supercomputer designed for the absolute cutting edge of visualization, powered by multiple MIPS RISC processors and the high-end Reality Engine 2 graphics subsystem. The Onyx would render 3D environments with a level of realism that had never been seen before, establishing SGI as a significant player in the supercomputer market. But despite all of the success of its high-end graphics business, SGI knew it had to expand into new markets to hedge against the anti-Intel workstation threat. In 1995, SGI spent roughly $500 million to acquire three key players in the computer graphics software world, Alias Research, Wavefront Technologies, and Croyer Films. Alias and Wavefront were two of the most advanced 3D modeling and animation software houses on the planet, and their products had already been used in Hollywood blockbusters. By bringing them in-house, SGI was ensuring that its hardware was tightly paired with world-class creative tools. At the same time, SGI partnered with DreamWorks SKG, forming DreamWorks Digital Studio. This new venture was meant to fuse SGI's cutting-edge graphics workstations with Alias Wavefront software to create a true next-generation digital production pipeline. It was a clear signal SGI wanted to dominate not just the hardware behind Hollywood special effects but the software ecosystem too. Then in February 1996, SGI made its boldest move yet, acquiring Cray Research for $740 million. Cray was legendary in the supercomputer world, but by the mid-90s it was struggling financially. For SGI, the deal was transformative. Overnight, it gave them control of about 40% of the global high-performance computing market. Industry analysts at the time debated SGI's motives. Why buy a struggling supercomputer company when SGI was thriving in graphics and visualization? But the logic was strategic. While SGI's Hollywood successes Jurassic Park, Terminator 2, and countless commercials got the headlines, entertainment only made up about 10% of SGI's revenue. The majority of its business actually came from government and research contracts. NASA in particular was a massive customer. By acquiring Cray, it was making sure that NASA's next generation supercomputers would be built, serviced and supported by STI. In effect, STI locked down one of its largest and most important customers. The visual workstation line introduced in 1997 was STI's attempt to enter the Intel-based market. These workstations ran Windows NT and Linux, aiming to offer high-performance computing at a lower cost. However, they failed to gain traction as Customers were already turning to more affordable and widely adopted alternatives from companies like Dell and Sun Microsystems. The move diluted SGI's brand identity and confused its customer base. Another ambitious launch was SGI's push into virtual reality modeling language for web-based 3D graphics. The company invested heavily, but the technology failed to gain traction and the expected returns never materialized. Despite a revenue of $3.7 billion in 1997, SGI's failed ambitions and expansions resulted in a $78 million loss. October 1997 also saw a major leadership shakeup. CEO Ed McCracken stepped down after 13 years. In January 1998, Richard Beluzzo took over CEO, bringing experience from Hewlett Packard and a mandate to revitalize SGI. However, SGI's decline had already begun. By 1998, SGI faced an existential threat from the rise of dedicated GPUs, yet the company initially underestimated these new graphics cards. SGI believed that consumer-oriented graphics cards could never match the performance of their proprietary MIPS workstations. This misjudgment left SGI unprepared for a market shift that would soon erode its core business. Nvidia, founded in 1993, quickly became a formidable competitor with its G4 series of graphics cards introduced in the late 90s. These GPUs 
SGIs offered high performance at a fraction of the cost of SGIs proprietary solutions, making advanced graphics accessible to a broader audience, and videos focused on the consumer market coupled with aggressive pricing allowed it to rapidly gain market share. 3DFX, another key player, introduced the Voodoo series of graphics cards, which became highly popular among gamers and professionals alike. The Voodoo cards were known for their exceptional 3D rendering capabilities, as Nvidia and 3DFX's products along with ATI's professional offerings became more powerful. They posed a significant threat to SGI's business, because while Windows and Intel machines were not powerful enough on their own to challenge SGI's high-end graphics capabilities, when you coupled an Intel processor, a Windows operating system, and the affordable GPUs from Nvidia, 3DFX, or ATI, the performance you got was good enough for most professional applications. Because of this, studios, engineering firms, and research labs increasingly shifted to clusters of Intel-based workstations with GPUs, making STI's expensive proprietary workstations increasingly unnecessary. The cost-effectiveness of these commodity systems, paired with sufficient performance for visualization and 3D work, eliminated the primary advantage STI had rallied on for over a decade. Compounding these problems was STI's decision in the early 2000s to pivot much of its servers and workstations toward Intel's Itanium architecture. The shift to Itanium proved catastrophic. Itanium's complex, epic architecture was difficult for developers to optimize, resulting in disappointing performance and slow software adoption. Legacy MIPS applications were incompatible, forcing expensive and time-consuming porting efforts, which further frustrated customers and delayed deployment. At the same time, SGI supercomputer and server divisions also suffered. Once the backbone of NASA, national labs, and high-end industrial clients, these systems were gradually replaced by clusters of commodity Intel servers running Linux, which offered similar or superior performance at much lower costs. By the mid-2000s, SGI's once dominant high-end server and supercomputing business had been largely eclipsed by IBM, HP, Dell, and open source cluster solutions. By 2005, SGI stock had fallen below the minimum required for New York Stock Exchange listing, and the company was delisted. In February 2006, SGI filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, citing unsustainable operations. In 2009, Rackable Systems acquired SGI's assets for $25 million, effectively ending the company as a standalone entity. What was once a $7 billion giant had faded into obscurity, leaving its remnants to be bought for only $25 million. In the end, the company that had invented real-time 3D graphics as we know it was undone by the very revolution it began. SGI's fall is a classic story of disruption. They built the future, but when the future arrived in mass market form, they couldn't adapt. But remember, every time you load a 3D game, design in CAD, or watch a CGI heavy movie, you are seeing SGI's fingerprints. They didn't survive the revolution, but they sparked it. Thank you for watching. And just a quick reminder to check out our sponsor, UPDF, the AI powered PDF editor and reader. You can find the link in the description below. Once more, thank you for watching and see you on the next one.